Um, so yes, I am Steve Saylor, and uh, before I kind of get into sort of uh, who I am, I want the panelists uh, to my left to be able to describe who they are and kind of uh, what they do, uh, and uh, just all around kind of more a little bit about them. So we'll start with uh, Jesse on the uh, far end. All right, uh, hello everybody. My name is Jesse Anderson, and I am currently, I have been running the Illegally Cited YouTube channel uh, for, yeah. <laughs> Uh, illegally cited YouTube channel, believe it or not, since 2012. And I've been a gamer pretty much as far as I can remember. Um, but really, especially once I started getting into the YouTube stuff, um, really kind of working on promoting accessibility, game accessibility, technology accessibility. Uh, I saw a prototype of the DK2 for the Oculus, and then I had to go get an Oculus Rift. And now I am definitely trying to advocate for VR accessibility, which we'll touch on a little bit later. But I'd also do a mixer a little bit and stuff like that as well. So, cool. Megan. All, all right. So, um, hi. My name is Megan Dornbrock, and my business card says I'm a professional magical girl. Um, and actually, what I do is, is a lot of different things, but they all kind of tie back into games. Um, I'm a freelance artist and illustrator in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, I do a podcast where I talk to game designers of tabletop games about how and why they change games. So we talk a lot about accessibility there uh, and how we can make games more inclusive for other people. Um, and then in my, my precious, precious free time that I get sometimes, uh, I work on making games that I want to play and that I want to see. Um, so I'm, I'm making some of my own content while also being blind. It's, it's fun. It's, you know. <laughs> Cool. Uh, hi, I, I'm Steve. I'm blind and I play video games. That's how I start off pretty much every video on my YouTube channel uh, called Blind Gamer. And uh, I've been doing it since about 2015. Uh, I grew up playing video games, but it was mostly watching my brother playing video games. So the Let's Play genre that uh, kind of started really becoming popular on YouTube was something that I really started to enjoy and kind of became nostalgic with, with because that's exactly what I had growing up. I couldn't play a lot of games growing up because just of my vision uh, and because I suck at them. It's more entertaining to watch me fail than it is for me to actually do well <laughs> and that's pretty much the crux of my YouTube channel. Because I started in 2015 where it was sort of like to be able to prove to my friends, you, like I've been telling you all this time I suck at video games, here's proof. Uh, and so I've been doing it sen uh, since then. I am, uh, so I've been a YouTuber, I've been an accessibility advocate. Uh, I also like have been a Twitch streamer, and I am a graphic designer. I'm, I'm a professor. I'm a video editor, all while being blind. Um, and but that doesn't necessarily uh, make me who I am in regards. To, like it's not usually um, sort of the vision that I have is not necessarily something that I, that I'm defined by. And that kind of brings me to essentially what the title of uh, this panel is. It sort of it kind of encapsulates we're gamers first, blind second. Um, because we do enjoy video games, we love video games, uh, and blindness doesn't necessarily uh, define us. So um, that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today, and we're going to be tackling some common obstacles on what we have when we're playing games. And we're also going to uh, discuss some of the solutions that we would love to be able to see in games, some of which are, we know that have been worked on or currently being worked on in, in video games, uh, but these are sort of the things that we have to tackle sort of on a daily basis. Um, so we'll start off with, uh, with Megan. I'm going to ask this question first. Okay. Because we, I want to get, I, I want to rip the Band-Aid off <laughs> oh, uh, no. right away. And by the way, this is a safe space. Oh boy. We don't, we don't worry, like so. This is okay. If you've worked on anything that we're going to be talking about, don't worry. We're not mad at you. <laughs> we're mad at the situation. Uh, so, Megan, why don't you talk about what is the worst game? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> That you that you have played that you, or at least more than yeah. you have difficulty being able to play. Sure, I wish um, the one that immediately came to mind. I actually cannot remember the name of it. Um, I have blocked it out completely. Uh, no, there is there is definitely uh, angry shouty tweets uh, I made, so I could probably look it back up. But there was um, it was for the PlayStation, and it was um, I love narrative games. Like that's my jam. I love stories in games. Um, and my husband and his family, uh, we were playing a game. Uh, I think it was on the PlayStation, where it, it was one of those, uh, you interact with it, like a story is happening and you get to vote on what happens next or something, and you use your, your, um, your cell phone as the controller to interact with this game. And I went, yes, this is gonna be amazing. I can sit with everybody else and kind of watch what's happening and not have to worry about fussing with, with menus and things on the screen. It's gonna be all on my phone. Um, it was not. <laughs> 
Fair. It was not that thing. Um, everything that I had to read was on the screen, and uh, you had the like the A B C D buttons was on your phone. That was it, uh, and and everything was timed as well, which is another um, I can mm. I can throw mm -hmm. a lot of salt about that later. Mm -hmm. um, timed choices in games. So we got about two, three or four minutes into this game, and I was like, I'm out. I'm yep. so mad. Um, yep. <laughs> So that's, that's probably the worst. There's a lot of things that are bad, but I think that was the most up, upset I have been trying to play a game. Right, so rage quit, essentially. Yes, yeah. in front of my in-laws. It's so good. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I empathize. Uh, all right, Jesse, what about you? Well, honestly, uh, you know, the funny thing is I can't think of a specific game. I know after this I totally will. Um, but I'm going to turn things on their side a little bit. Um, mention a couple different things. The first games, I guess I would mention, there are, there's a series that were actually mentioned earlier this morning, uh, the Yakuza games. Uh, I love I love the idea of the Yakuza games. Uh, I was obsessed with it when Shenmue came out. Shenmue 3 coming this fall? Huzzah. Uh, but the problem with Yakuza is it's all audio in Japanese, and if you can't follow along with the subtitles, like this is a story-based game, and I really, really want to do it. I mean, yeah, I can go to GameFAQs and look up where to do, how to do, whatever. But, like, I, I want to be able to, like, even if, I, even if I could do text-to-speech or, you know, just so I know exactly what is going on when it's happening, uh, I can do my melee combat, I can do, I can all explore all the craziness that that, uh, that those series has. But that's the one that makes me really sad. Fair enough. Mm. Um, for myself... I know it's beloved, and you're probably gonna cringe when I say it. Uh, the Witcher Three, um, that game was hard, uh, mainly because I mean I fell in love with the, with the story, and I, I kept all my friends kept telling me that it was a game that I that I should love, and I started to. It was fine, and then when you get into the menu system, <laughs> um, <laughs> Essentially, I mean. the, the text was just unfortunately way too small. And in order mm -hmm. for me to be able to play, kind of explain my gaming setup is that I'm usually sitting about one to two feet away from my screen, which is generally uh, either a 42 inch or a 55 inch uh, TV. Uh, it's actually to the point where my computer that I'm currently using right now is a 42 inch TV uh, that I've basically like, it's, it, it just sits within about a, a foot, two feet away from me. Um, with The Witcher, at the time I was playing it on my, on my couch, there were many times that I essentially had to keep getting up, standing up and leaning in closer, usually within centimeters from the screen, in order to be able to read what menu item I was actually focused on. Yeah. And uh, I mean, besides getting a great calisthenic workout from having to get up and, and get it sitting down, <laughs> um, it was rather difficult to be able to enjoy the game. And I know that uh, CD Projekt Red, they did release a patch that essentially increased the font size. I didn't see what font size they increased, so I don't <laughs> yes. know if it worked or not. Um, but it was something that, uh, that essentially was just really, really difficult to be able to play. And that's kind of the example that I usually give um, for sort of what, what we've been playing. So uh, before we kind of get into sort of the mechanics of kind of what we're able mm -hmm. to see within games, I do want to be able to have, do some goodwill within the game. <laughs> Is there a game that you love that you love to play? Uh, yeah, we'll start with uh, Megan. Uh, just in general, or because it has great accessibility? Uh, like, just the game the, the in general. That's something that, that you I enjoy love to play. Yeah. I love Dragon Age games, and I will play them over and over and over again until the end of time. Um, so that's my answer. Cool. <laughs> Jesse? Ooh, really tough to say. I, I think my favorite game, uh, if not series, I love Doom, the original Doom. Mod the heck out of it. Doom 2016, Doom Eternal coming out pretty soon. Uh, look, really like that. As far as accessibility-wise goes, there's a couple things I really briefly want to mention. Um, everything now is going open world. And so one of the things that I think is the most frustrating is mini-maps. Yeah, they're evil, I said it. Um, games like Saints Row the Third, Saints Row IV, um, Red Faction Guerrilla, I love those because they actually, pretty much you don't have to pay attention to the mini-map and I am able to, like, Red Faction's got these glowy arrows right along on the road. Uh, the Saints Row games have got these colored arrows that are just glowy neon arrows that are 
uh, when you hit the intersections and just being able to look right in front of where you're driving instead of trying to, uh, to look at this tiny mini map while you're you know, mowing over pedestrians and getting your wanted level up. Uh, you know, it's a little difficult. So I, I really love that. Cool. Uh, I'd say for myself, uh, my favorite game uh, of all time used to be uh, the first Red Dead Redemption, uh, mm -hmm. just because I was a huge uh, Western uh, fan. Uh, but it has now been uh, trumped by uh, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Uh, it's a game, it was my first really official Zelda game that I've played. I know that's sacrilege to some people in this room. Uh, and no, I have not played Link to the Past yet. Uh, oh. That's going to be in my YouTube channel soon, so youtube.com slash snowball. Um, <laughs> so, but it, with Breath of the Wild, it kind of opened up to something that I, I never, like I never got to experience uh, before, and I loved the open world style of the game, and allowed you to kind of like, there was always something new around every single corner, and always something different around every single corner. It wasn't just the, the general same thing that you would always see, especially with all those shrines, and yes, I did collect all 120 shrines. <laughs> uh, and it was, it was something that I bought roughly a month after the Switch came out, and I was playing it every single day for two and a half months, mm -hmm. and I would play it on the streetcar on my way to work and back every single day. And I remember the, the, my favorite moment of it was uh, there's the Lionel kind of on top of the mountain uh, near the beginning of the game. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It took me two days to be able to, uh, be able to defeat it, and then to find out afterwards, oh, you didn't have to defeat it, you could just sneak around him. And I'm like, <laughs> Okay, yeah. great, but at least now I, I felt accomplished. I was able to like, kill him at a very <laughs> early level. Uh, so that is a game that I love. Um, and actually, you know what, uh, because Jesse mentioned it as far as accessible game, Megan, what is a game that you'd love that does have a really good uh, accessibility features? And I'll uh, touch on mine. Oh, um, I, I don't know about specifically uh, tailored accessibility features, but I definitely really like a lot of the Nintendo games um, because I find that they are often very easy to read. Like, um, I love Animal Crossing. I, I don't play shooters, but I also love Splatoon um, because there's there's things to do that aren't just shooting other people. Um, but they're always, yeah, it's always easy to read things. I can navigate the menus well. I know what's going on because they give me information in multiple different ways. Um, so, so Nintendo's just really good at that for me. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, for myself, it uh, it has to go with like this became my uh, the game of the year for for last year, uh, Marvel Spider Man. Uh, it was a game that not only had some amazing accessibility features like what was mentioned earlier with the uh, you can sort of turn the Q, uh, the QTE segments off, um, and as well as sort of just the, uh, the the breadth of just different kind of abilities that were there. But for me, what really made it accessible was the trophies. I have never been able to collect a platinum trophy ever in any game uh, that I've been able to play because it's mostly a lot of the trophies were locked under a skill level. Uh, Spider-Man was the first game that I've ever platinumed. And when I realized that that was the, gonna be the case for me, I had three trophies left at the end, but I was already at the end game uh, within the story. And so it'd be not only to be able to complete a story that I fell in love with and became emotional with, uh, to be able to complete that with the platinum uh, trophy meant an absolute world to me, and that basically became, like I said, my, my game of the year last year. Um, so we'll talk into a little bit more specifics about stuff about kind of our barriers, but I kind of want to, because being able to talk about low vision, it's kind of hard to sort of say what type of vision we have or how to be able to de kind of describe it mm -hmm. uh, for certain people who, uh, who either have 20-20 vision or have better vision than we do. Um, so Jesse, we'll start with you, kind of, how can you describe, uh, describe as best you can, sort of the vision that you have um, and that also what it is you're able to really see? Right, so uh, yeah, that, that's one of those things that's really kind of tricky to explain because everyone's, if you're low vision, everyone's just on this huge spectrum. Um, myself, I'll kind of relate it to games specifically. Um, I tend to have trouble with things that are that really blend in uh, really well or that are off in the distance or a combination of things. So thing, you know, military shooters, not so much into those just because I know they're purposely, you know, the enemies are purposely meant to uh, blend in that kind of a thing. Um, reading small print, uh, e e you know, even what people would say maybe medium print, like I'm still generally really close to uh, a computer monitor or a TV, that kind of a thing. Um, as a low vision user, not just with games, but for computers and such, uh, my phone, whatever, I will often use a combination of like 
I'll use my vision to pinpoint something, but then if I'm able to like tap it on my phone or move the mouse over it, and I'll have some sort of a text-to-speech via screen reader or something, and so I'm kind of using my vision that I have when it relates to text um, to be able to focus in what lo on like, oh, that looks interesting, and then have that spoken aloud, which is why, well, I'll, I'll save that for later because I know where there was a list, wish list thing here later on. Yeah. Uh, Megan? Um, yeah, so what I am able to see, I suppose. Um, my, my visual impairment comes from albinism, um, and so a lot of my issues are light-related. Um, as, as Jesse was saying, there's a lot of different kind of things going into visual impairment and all these different like spectrums you could be on for different abilities or different axes of things. So um, uh, maybe this will make sense to some of y'all. So I, I have full field of vision, so that's something that, that low vision people deal with is, is um, you know, whether they have periphery or, or spots or things. So I do have full field. Um, I am very nearsighted. Um, I'm legally blind. I am light sensitive. My, my eyes have a thing called nystagmus, which means they move on their own. They just sort of do what they want to do. And uh, the more I try to focus on something, the worse it gets, or the, the more tired I am, or the more stressed I am, it gets worse and focus just gets that much harder, like actual physical focus on a thing. Um, so what I have difficulty with is, of course, text uh, of most sizes. Uh, I have, the, the more realistic game graphics are getting, the less I am able to differentiate what's going on in them, hence my gravitation towards the, the brightly colored Nintendo games, um, where I can, I, I can tell the difference uh, b between things in a cartoon. I can't tell the difference between things in the real world. That's my issue. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that mostly covers it. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I actually have very, a vision very similar to hers. Uh, I also do have albinism. Uh, I have a condition called nystagmus. Uh, best way I've been able to kind of describe it uh, is for those who may not know sort of like, when you hear like the term like 20-20 vision, you may not understand sort of kind of what that specifically means, but uh, for as a very basic term, is if you're looking at, if you have 20-20 vision, if you're looking at something that's 20 feet away, to you it looks like it's 20 feet away. Uh, for myself, and I would assume probably for you, Megan, is mm -hmm. like my vision with glasses on mm -hmm. is 2200. Yes. Yeah, uh, so it's, yeah, it's like something that's 20 feet away, it looks like it's yeah. 200 feet away. Uh, with glasses off, I mean, mine is actually, <laughs> I think, like 2700. Does that yeah. kind of similar to yours? Yeah, um, uh, it's not good. <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, so essentially, I mean, with the nystagmus and the fact that our eyes move back and forth, it is an involuntary eye movement, it makes it very blurry. So, like uh, Megan said, like, Text for me is, is, a, is a big issue. Uh, being able to kind of move around the real world and recognizing people. Uh, there's many a times where I will uh, have someone be able to like either honk a horn at me as they're passing by or they recognize me and they kind of, uh, they wave at me or whatever. And I, I don't, rec I can't yeah. see them and people think I'm rude for some reason. Uh, and that's not the case. Uh, so it's, I usually won't be able to recognize you or see you uh, when it's up close. Like even actually sitting here right now, I can see there's people in the room, but I can't tell who's who, uh, just mm -hmm. like even just when you're a few feet away. Um, so what I kind of want to uh, sort of pivot in, into um, is more about kind of the, the barriers that we face. We kind of touched a little bit about it on sort of the vision uh, specific uh, question, but I want to, in regards to video games, what are some specific barriers that you have when you're tackling to build it uh, and getting into a video game, um, like mm -hmm. for the first time, uh, let's say, um, let Jesse, what, uh, do you have uh, do you have any uh, ideas for that one? Sure, um, I guess with all, especially with a lot of modern games, um, you know, just the, the games have become so complex, and you know, learning the interface. Sometimes the menus aren't necessarily you know up and down or left and right. They've got little, they got big squares, little squares, things over here. Oh, if you hit this secret button over here, it brings us to the, the, the menu that's not actually on the screen, uh, that kind of a thing. But uh, in-game, I think, where, where I'm finding myself actually, uh, in a way, having the most trouble is, you know, I play a lot of action, you know, I like a lot of action games, third person, first person, action adventure, that kind of a thing. And there's a lot of, like, everything is starting to do a lot more with, like, uh, getting better loot, getting better inventory items, weapons, mm -hmm. armor, uh, skill trees, uh, you know, multiple skill trees. And like, I wanna, the, the thing is, is I wanna be able to save my vision for playing the game, but when I have to stop and, 
you know, oh, I just got a new piece of armor. Okay, now I got to compare these stats with that stat. Is that better? Is that not? Um, where did that go? Did, you know, what part of the interface did that go to? So, like, you know, I, you know, this ties into the kind of the wish list later on. But like I said, it, you know, there's games are starting to include more uh, text to speech and menus and things like that. But I'm eagerly awaiting the the point where I can kind of pause the action for a moment and then being able to just, you know, have some of that uh, audio, you know, talk about, we talked uh, earlier this morning about having multiple ways of receiving information. So like, okay, I pause the game, I, I gotta look at my skill trees, I got three skill points I wanna use. Um, just being able to, you know, relax my eyes a little bit and kind of arrow through and listen to the different stats and pick the ones I want. So that kind of interfacing, that's where, cause it gets really kind of overwhelming and I'm like, I don't know if I wanna sit there and take a whole bunch of time, all the time, to, to navigate those types of stuff. Uh, in addition to that, are there, are there any genres uh, of games that you typically would avoid just because of unaccessible, how unaccessible they are to you? Uh, I would say really text heavy games, uh, a lot of the smaller titles, uh, like especially text, you know, RPGs that have a lot of text. One thing, I was recently playing the Secret of Mana remake. Uh, on Steam not too long ago, and I like that because I still have to navigate the, uh, you know, like your inventory and all that, but that's not too bad. But all character dialogue, uh, whether they're just talking to each other or in a cutscene, is now voiced. So, you know, having played a little bit of that way back in the day uh, and going, eh, I kind of fell off of it because there was so much text to read. And now I can just, like I said, anyone talks, I can enjoy it with full voice acting. Cool. Thanks. Megan? Um, yeah, so I like that you phrased it with well, barriers when we're first getting into a game because we can, we have and we will talk a lot about options you can put in the game and menus and, and different things like that. Um, and we, we heard a bunch about those different approaches you can take mechanically. But barriers that I'm finding when I first get into a game are in the realm of finding information about the game before I buy it. Uh, oh, so call. from the developer, what have they made available before I spend my money? Is there anything on their website that talks about what I'm able to do in this game or what options mm -hmm. I have? Is there a demo I can play? Um, and then there's also the, the realm that's a little outside of their control is, is pushback from the community. When I go and I go to forums to ask for answers and I say, what can you tell me about this game? And if you've ever seen a Reddit post about, hi, I'm having trouble with this, <laughs> just don't read it. It's the worst. Um, they're not very helpful. So it's, it's that pushback about like, well, why do you even need that information? Why do you, why should we bother? Um, so that's, that's where a lot of my frustration comes in because I actually, I love the text heavy games, I love the narrative games, I love the story games, and I would of course love to see them be a little bit more legible because I'm the nerd that gets excited when I find a codex entry. You know, tell me more about this obscure cult of Andraste that has no bearing on the game whatsoever. I'm, I want to read it. I do too, um, but I want them read to me. Yeah, <laughs> that would be great. They have such great voice actors in those games. They could just read it to me, Brian Bloom. Okay, anyway. Sorry. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> Uh, is there good. a genre that uh, 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 that you kind of usually avoid? Oh, I do not play first-person shooters. Um, Fair. Yeah, I, uh, Splatoon has been my exception. And then um, we actually talked earlier this morning. I tried playing Mass Effect because I, I love the Bioware game so much. And, uh, and I play on a computer, and I installed what I was advertised as a god mode, but I still died, so... <laughs> <laughs> I, no, Who knows how that I, happened? I, I'm very good. That's how it happened. <laughs> right. Uh, for myself, kind of usually, like Megan said exactly, like finding information about a game beforehand. I mean, for me, trailers and screenshots can help, mm -hmm. but being able to kind of find that information of how it is an actual gameplay uh, is, is a bit of an issue. Uh, for example, for me, um, I was one who pre-ordered Anthem. And I, uh, I also pre-ordered it from EB Games uh, up in Canada. Yes, they still do exist. Uh, and I all of a sudden get a call from, uh, from them and they say, oh, hey, you can get access to the VIP demo. I'm like, oh, cool, all right. So I figured I'd download it and give it a try. Minus all the bug issues aside uh, during that time, uh, when I was actually able to play uh, some of the missions, uh, I found that they were really difficult uh, because it, the rubber banding kept kind of, mm -hmm. especially with the matchmaking, I kept putting, I, get, I kept getting match, 
up with people that were so far better than I was that essentially by the time the rubber banding of the missions kind of kept me g catching up to them, uh, I, they had already completed the mission by the time I was able to uh, find them. And that to me is, is generally is a barrier. I mean, I love I, I know that sort of games of service is kind of is a bit of a trending uh, sort of genre in games, and I love them. I mean, I'm a I'm a hardcore Destiny two fan right now, uh, and I absolutely love that. However, um, when it gets to the, again, it gets to the point where I'm being like matched up with people that I don't know, it's hard for me to be able to kind of join in and actually feel like I can I, I can contribute because right. of just the ability like the disability that I do have, and when and I feel bad for the players that I'm playing against because they're not able to enjoy the experience as they wanted to because they're essentially having to backpack me or sherpa me throughout the entire game. And I don't want them to be able to do that because I want to contribute and so do they. So uh, that's why I usually try to be able to play with some of my friends instead. Um, and unfortunately because Anthem was a game that just was hard for me to be able to play, I unfortunately canceled my pre-order and have not been able to jump in since. Um, a genre for me that is really hard for me to be able to play Platformers. Oh. <laughs> I suck at them so bad. Um, <laughs> I literally, I just plugged in my SNES Classic Mini uh, the other day because, I, again, like I said, I was trying to get set up so I can be able to play Link to the Past. And I figured, yeah, you know what? I'll jump into Super Mario World. See how that was. I died five times in World 1-1. Um, so that, to me, like, it, just being able to have the... It, it's a more precise, specific thing mm -hmm. about jumping to where you want it to go. I can't seem to get that eye-hand coordination to work properly. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. anything that's platformers... I mean, I would love to play Dead Cells. I would love to play The Messenger. Uh, I would mm -hmm. love to play a lot of those games. But unfortunately, I just am not great at it, and I would generally uh, try to avoid them. Um, but in regards to, I guess, kind of jumping into sort of the things that we wish... Would we uh, we would be able to have in games? I'll kind of start off by basically saying, demos. I would love it if there was more demos of games to be able to play uh, before uh, I'm actually able to jump in. Like, because like we said, being able to find that information yeah. out beforehand. Sure, that can be like there can be sites that kind of would review that from a, a in progress standpoint uh, before the game comes out, and that is really helpful uh, to people like us. But it, there's nothing there's nothing more uh, better than having the experience of actually playing the game itself as it was intended. Uh, and I know that like developing demos is, is obviously a much larger tack like issue to be able to kind of tackle uh, a larger obstacle because it's like, okay, what do we give the players in, in that sense without having to spoil the end the, the game itself? Mm -hmm. um, so but for me, I would love to be able to uh, have demos because I was ready to play anthem and enjoy it. But if I did it, like if I go that experience, I had the demo, and it made me realize I'm not able to play this game, uh, and I unfortunately just basically just didn't go further with it. Um, so being able to have demos would be really uh, helpful. Again, for me, I think we can both, we all three of us can agree, large text would be great, uh, especially yes. in the HUD. <laughs> Uh, like I, I find that the, I will say like, as a good example of that, um, recently literally just came out was the Division Two. Um, the large menu items, uh, the fact that it was a narrated a menu, that's something that I've been wanting in games since I was a kid. Uh, unfortunately, though, when you kind of get into the game, there was a lot of like really small text and sort of the help uh, tips and the HUD itself. You're able to resize a little bit of the HUD uh, to make it a little bit easier, and that's something I, uh, I never saw before. But it was something that it was still, there were still moments where I had to kind of get up and, and get closer to the screen. Uh, and then also, being able to see enemies from far off, because I'm one of those, I need to have cover and I need to sort of be away from, like distance away from a from character in order to be able to know what I'm shooting at before they come and attack me. And if they're really small and all they have is like a little tiny semicircle of red above their uh, heads, that's something that can't be distinguished. And again, I'm using Division 2, and I love Division 2, by the way. Uh, the, there's, a, there's a mission called In the Parking Garage where there's a lot of like green and red lights that are above each parking spot. Because I became accustomed to seeing the little red lights above enemies' heads, I kept shooting at, at basically at nothing. <laughs> As I'm trying to figure out where everyone is, I died, I probably will say about 15, 20 times just in that section alone. Um, so being able to kind of distinguish enemies, I think Uncharted 4 did it pretty well uh, with thief mode. And I know that there's the pulse uh, sort of ability you can have in Division 2 that will help make kind of highlight the enemies. But that should also not necessarily be a skill that you unlock. It should just be a skill that you can just turn on and off mm -hmm. uh, as needed. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of sort of just the 
bare bones a, a wish list, but uh, we'll start with uh, you, Jesse. What is sort of a wish list? Like, what is the dream features that you've been wanting for so long that you are mad that it's not there? <laughs> right. Well, you touched on a few of them already, um, but before I do, I just want to really give credit to one of the, my favorite games that I thought I wouldn't be able to play, but because of unintentionally uh, what they did, it works really well. Left 4 Dead 1 and 2. Um, mm -hmm. Having the, like w when a character is behind a wall, you can see their outline. You see the names above their heads, so you know like, oh, okay, I'm not shooting a zombie, I'm shooting my teammate, whoops. Uh, or if I am, you know, picking up health items or ammo or whatever, uh, not only that visually, but you have so many audio cues that they do well. So I can tell even before they come on the screen, oh, there's a hunter coming. Oh, crap, there's a tank. There's the tank music. Uh, you know, or you hear like a, the, the sound effects and the music for a boomer or whatever it is. And you even have the characters in the game calling that stuff out. It's like, I hear a witch. You know, that kind of a thing. So... You have that, um, but as far as like a wish list goes, like I said, large text, you know, even larger than you probably think is necessary is yeah. a good idea. Uh, you know, they said th their vision, uh, to give you an idea, their vision, you know, 20 over 200. My best eye, unfortunately, is 20 over 800. So, yeah, go me. Um, but so, you know, a large text, um, you know, narration of more in-game things. Again, I touched on that already. Um, I, I do want to call out a couple games. Like, if you want to see a game that is fantastic, it's basically what I want from, like, I, I would dream to have every game. If you go on the <coughs> PC and you grab a game called Skullgirls, mm. turn on Narrator that's built into Windows or grab a free copy of NVDA, the screen reader, you can run any uh, screen reader, reader with that PC version of the game. From the moment you turn it on to the moment you exit, like, the menu speak. You can pause the game, go to the move list. If you're doing the story thing and you get little text things of dialogue, everything's like, when I saw that, it was just, it blew my mind. I'm like, okay, somebody proved that it's possible. Let's make it happen everywhere now. Come on, I, I would just love to see that. And an upcoming game based on the, this is how accessibility sells as well. Um, a developer, for a little game called Eagle Island. It's not out yet, but I saw the accessibility video that he released. He's like, oh, hey, check this out. I want as many people as I want or as we can to play this. I saw it, it had like large dialogue. It had, they were scrolling through like the, in, the, the shop. They had uh, like the character dialogue. It was all you could turn on self-voicing. They had visual outlines to draw your attention. That would help you maybe with the platforming just to draw things out, which, yeah. which is in the foreground or not. That'd be great. Uh, you know, <laughs> you, you got to go look up the trailer. Go look up the Eagle Island accessibility. Just go type that into YouTube. Uh, cool. Sold. I want it now. Um, so, yeah, a couple things just to shout out there. Cool. Megan? Oh, so a wish list. Um, <laughs> I, I really think it just comes down to options. We, we saw a lot of great talks this morning about parallel information and how if, if there's anything that you want to convey that is important, that is interesting, that is fun, you need to do it in more than one way to ensure that people can, can grasp it. Um, and I think just having those options built into games from the start is, is all I want. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. Being high able contrast menu options. Yes. Yeah, high, high exactly. Contrast menu options. High, like yeah. high contrast, um, being able to, to adjust the sound, the text size. And I, and I absolutely understand the, the hesitance to, to make text bigger and bigger because my beautiful HUD, my, my graphics, you're destroying them. I get it. I'm an artist. <laughs> but the beautiful thing about design is that there are more than one, there's, there's multiple paths to you know, this end result that's going to elicit the reaction that you want from your player. Um, and that's something that I actually talk to uh, my tabletop guests about a lot is, is, what is what do you want your player to feel like when they have played this game? What, how do you want them to come out of this you know, having experienced? Um, and then work backwards from there because there's more than one way to make somebody feel uh, scared for a horror game or to make them feel like a big hero. Um, mm -hmm. And just give us the options to turn on the ones that work best for us is what I really, really want. So. Cool. Uh, all right, so I, uh, well, I have two questions kind of I have left, but um, 
I definitely want to touch on a little bit uh, about VR uh, because that's something that's obviously been coming a little bit more in the forefront with the Oculus, with the HTC, and obviously the PlayStation VR. Um, so I want to kind of ask, sort of, uh, A, have you been able to chance to try VR, mm -hmm. and also, what are some of the things that you kind of enjoy and, and maybe not so enjoy about VR that would that you would love to be able to see improved? Uh, so Megan, uh, have you had a chance? Um, I have done a little bit. Uh, I was I was in a program. Um, actually, my degree is in computer animation and interactive media, and so we did a, a little bit of VR in some of our classes. And I was bad at it. Um, <laughs> but we there was we did like some some basic like carnival game kind of things. And then I know I did like um, one of those Game of Thrones simulations where you're like shooting the guys coming down from the wall, or you are shooting them if you're not me. Um, and it's interesting. Uh, it's it's hard to do with glasses on. I think that's something that folks are still figuring out. Um, I, I was greatly relieved that I, I didn't get motion sickness. I thought that would be a problem, but it wasn't. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, but it's generally, uh, I play games on the computer or on handheld so that I can get myself as close to the thing as possible. But the thing about VR is you keep moving closer and it gets further away because it, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Um, so that's, that's a, a difficult thing, but I haven't really played with it much more than that. So I think Jesse yeah, knows Jesse. more than I do. <laughs> okay, I'll try to keep this short. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> Strap it, folks. Yeah, right. no, um, but uh, I, yeah, like I said earlier, I saw the dev kit for the DK2 Oculus Rift. Uh, I saw tons of potential there. I definitely had some concerns, but I pre-ordered the consumer version. I've had it since launch. And there are some things I absolutely love about it. I mean, the extra sense of immersion. I know it's one of those kind of cliche things to say that like, if you haven't seen VR, like if you, if, if you haven't experienced it, like it's just, it's hard to explain how cool it is. Um, and that's great. Um, but where I have, uh, the, I actually have some concerns with like current headsets and where we're going actually, because so with the Rift, like, uh, like you just mentioned, one of the things that, especially on the main menus and pause screens and tool tips, what I often find so frustrating is that, especially if you have a headset that does full six degrees of freedom tracking, meaning that not just turning your head left, right, up and down, mm -hmm. but I can lean forward, I can lean back. Um, but when I do that, what happens is you lean forward and you the, the, the experience basically keeps the interface yeah. Like we, we want it to look like it's five feet away from you regardless of where you lean. But games like, uh, you know, there's some like uh, job simulator where the whole interface is like, it's all part of the environment. So if I need to lean in to look at what it says on that, on that screen or on that menu option, I can. And there are a few other ones that do that. And that is super important. Where I am kind of scared is uh, like I said, I love VR, I want to keep doing it, but there's a lot of these standalone headsets, the Oculus Quest that's coming out later this year, several other ones that are going to be standalone. Right now, my saving grace is that when I'm at my computer, I can do all my store browsing, my downloading, my uninstalling through the desktop interface, and if I have trouble seeing something in the headset that's straight ahead of me, I can kind of lift up my headset and I can kind of look at the monitor to get as, get close to that and try to read the flat image of it. Of course, that doesn't work if the text is over here and I got to turn my head over here to read it because then I can't look at the monitor. Uh, but when you get these standalone headsets, you're not going to be mirroring the image to anything. So having, uh, you know, being able to manage that from my phone, from my computer, all of that, the the app and uh, app and game management. But even in the experiences and the games themselves, just, you know, again, you know, adding text to speech, adding high contrast, adding large print is going to be so crucial because you don't have that extra screen to fall back on when you're a self-contained headset. And really quickly, just a cheap plug, if you want more on VR accessibility, cheap plug, uh, I do have an entire playlist on my YouTube channel. Uh, presentation that I did at, at hashtag uh, ID24 in 2017, uh, Inclusive Design 24 on VR accessibility for low vision. And I have several other videos, not just for low vision, but different aspects of VR accessibility. So uh, if you want to uh, get more into that, uh, I have thoughts. <laughs> uh, for myself, uh, some of you probably, I don't know if you've 
I had a video that went viral uh, where I, it, like, I tried VR for the first time, uh, and I was playing with the HTC Vive, uh, basically playing the Star Wars uh, uh, Tatooine experience. And uh, it's it, if you want a good cry, it's it's a good video to check out. I mean, I, I, it's a good cry. Don't worry. Um, for me, VR, it was the when I tried it for the first time. It was the first time I was actually able to play a video game with my glasses off. Um, being able to have that screen really close to my eyes, while still blurry, and it was a little bit still difficult to be able to read like specific text, like especially with the Star Wars, like the text scroll that uh, mm -hmm. that kind of happens on the screen. Uh, that was a little bit difficult to read at first. I was able to still be able to play the entire experience with my glasses off, and that kind of changed sort of how I approach games. It made me feel normal. It made me feel and going back to the title of, the, of this uh, talk, is that it made me feel like an actual gamer and not a blind gamer. Uh, and it was something that was a life-changing experience to the point where uh, I, was, when I, I was able to purchase myself a PlayStation VR. And I've been loving it pretty much ever since. There are many times I will put on the headset to be able to play any game in theater mode because there's an option in there to be able to make the screen pretty much almost as big as a movie size screen. Uh, that you would go into a cinema to be able to see. And I was able to play. Like, sure, there was times I still had to kind of lean in in order to be able to see what was on the screen. But the fact that I, I, I don't have to necessarily put a lot of effort, I can still I still sit back on my couch or in my chair. Three minute warning. Thank you. Uh, to be able to do that, it was still like really, really cool to be able to do. Um, so with that said, the one, one last quick question I have, because there's probably developers from your favorite studios here uh, in this room, am I included. Is there a game that you're looking forward to that the developer, if you're here, we want to talk to you about uh, that's coming out? Megan? Anybody here from BioWare? No. <laughs> See, there you go. Uh, um, Jesse? Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, that, I'm good. Yeah, Jesse? <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, Bethesda, id? Oh, Maybe? I heard a woo. Bueller. 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 Uh, for myself, yes. for myself, uh, Bungie. I would love to know. Destiny yeah. three confirmed? Not confirmed? Uh, let's. Anyway. Um, cool. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, might as well just send it off. So where can we be able to find you guys online? So uh, Jesse, uh, where's the best place to be able to uh, take a look at you? Well, you can find me online. Like I said, go to illegallycited.com. That is my website. But you can also go to youtube.com slash illegallycited for the channel. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at BGFH79. Uh, Mixer.com slash BGFH. And if you want, I do have business cards up uh, the front. So uh, definitely grab one of those. And uh, yeah. Cool, cool. Megan? Uh, and I am at Meglish, just about anywhere on the internet. That's M-E-G-L-I-S-H. I mostly yell on Twitter. Um, and the Meglish on the PlayStation Network is not me, and I'm mad about it. Oh, so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like I said before, you can find me uh, YouTube.com slash Snowball. Uh, yes, I was able to get that URL. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I, I'm there, at Steve Saylor. Um, Saylor spelled a little weird. It's Saylor like is in the actual Saylor, but with Y, S-A-Y-L-O-R. Um, or you can be able to find me on Twitch, twitch.tv slash blindgamersteve. I'm also on the PSN and Xbox. Uh, that's my ID as yeah. well. Um, so thank you guys for being able to join us. And thank you for allowing us to be able to be here. And uh, we hope that uh, it was entertaining and uh, educational. Uh, so thanks so much, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>